Tonight's speaker really does not need an introduction because he's a perennial. He comes practically every year, but I, for good measure, I will um, introduce him anyway. <laughs> Dr. Lars Nordstrom is tonight's speaker, and he has delighted us with a variety of presentations over the years, several of which were on Swedish immigration, with such titles as Swedish Post-War Immigration, Swedes in America, and the Story of Swedish Origin. Lars lived in Sweden until 1974 and has spent many years abroad, mainly in America, where he uh, settled with his wife Cynthia on a vineyard in Beaver Creek, Oregon, near Oregon City. Lars was educated at the University of Stockholm, Portland State University, and Uppsala University, where he got his PhD in the English literature. He has published translations, articles, poems in several countries. He is also the author of the book, Making It Home, for which he got an Oregon Book Award. The title of tonight's presentation is Recent Immigrants to the North Coast. So let us welcome Lars Nordstrom. recent Scandinavian or Swedish immigrants to the Northwest. I'm not going to talk about Hispanics or, <laughs> or the French or, or the Russians or anything. I'm going to talk mostly about the Swedes. I forgot, but I forgot to put Swedish in there. Yeah, you didn't say, I don't think you oh, mentioned it, but I, yeah. so I, 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 I don't know that I really needed to say it anyway because you wouldn't be here to listen to um, me talking about the Hispanics. Maybe or somebody else. <laughs> anyway, uh, this book came out in the spring, uh, Ten New Lives, Swedes in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it was originally published in Swedish, it came out there, and then we translated it. And uh, it has, it, it's a book of oral histories. It has the stories of, of ten, ten people in it, uh, five uh, women and uh, five men, uh, all in my generation. I call them the post-Vietnam War period immigrants. And there's a reason for that, and I'll get into that. And um, um, they tell their stories um, uh, about um, why they left Sweden and how they ended up here and how it is to be an immigrant today. Uh, I, I work as a, as a writer and a translator, so I spend a lot of time with language. And it seems to me words are, are, are immigrants too. If you take this word, um, for example, uh, as it's tilled, uh, the Spanish word uh, canyon, you know, when that was incorporated into English, it looked like this originally. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it became, it, it was sort of Americanized, but it was still always put in italics because it was a foreign word. And then it becomes simply just canyon, no italics. And that process of bringing foreign words into the language, it's the immigrant experience. You know, you come, you're totally foreign, <laughs> you spell your name really differently, then for a number of years, you remain in italics. <laughs> you're not really incorporated, but you're still in italics, and then eventually, uh, you don't even have your italics. Um, so, so words are immigrants too. Think about that when you're running cross foreign words in um, in, uh, in, in a text. I think smorgasbord now doesn't have like, italics. <laughs> Ombudsman doesn't have. Uh, those are the only words really I know. Iceberg, I think, is a Swedish word too. Um, but it's spelled slightly differently. Uh, I said that this was a post-Vietnam War uh, period immigrant group. And there were two important things that happened uh, in the mid-70s. Uh, the transatlantic ships stopped going. Uh, the Swedes have been running ships for almost 100 years at that time. All the immigrants that came before, before the 70s were people who traveled on the surface. It took a month almost to go from Sweden to Oregon back in the really early days. Then they shaved it down to maybe, you know, if you travel continuously, it would take two weeks. With the jet age, it's less than 24 hours. And it does something, I think, to your sense of where you are 
it's not far away. Living in, on the other side of the planet is just, you know, it's just a trip away. And so I call it the annihilation of distance. That's part of the modern immigrant experience. Another thing that happened in the 70s was that uh, the Swedish press finally folded. Uh, the, the Swedish press in America had been the second largest foreign language press after the German press uh, in the United States. Uh, in 1910, there were 350 Swedish newspapers in America. By uh, 1975, there were three struggle, struggle, struggling survivors, and um, none of them really wrote in Swedish anymore. It was mostly in English. Uh, the uh, one for the Northwest, Svenska Posten, I think folded in 1974 or 76 or somewhere about there. So that's a new Fanon out of New York. It's the one that one of the few that remains. There's Svenska Posten up in Vancouver, uh, Canada. And West Coast has been kind of revived, uh, but those are mostly in English now. And the newspaper uh, filled a really important function for immigrants. Um, because uh, Swedes and other, uh, you know, Scandinavians who came, they were literate people, they could read and write, they just couldn't speak English. So a Swedish uh, or a Danish or Norwegian newspaper could provide information not only about the place where they live, but also about uh, home, uh, provide news from home. And that was really important, and that didn't exist. And you have to, it's hard to, remember, to think back now how it was before the internet, because the internet changed all of this. But when I came in the late 70s, I came to Portland the first time in 1978, it was really like being dropped in a vacuum. Uh, you came here and it was like no way to keep in touch. I was a student here at PSU, couldn't afford to call. My father would call me once a month, he'd call me, you know, we chat and find out. But you had to write letters. It took a week for a letter to get there, and it took a week for a letter to come back. And it's very difficult to keep in touch. When you're a Swede living in a country like this, you know, how often is Sweden in the news? You know, well, you know, hardly ever. Um, so it, it was really, and, and then at that point, you know, there was no Swedish community. There was a Swedish American community, but no Swedish community. So that really had, had changed uh, uh, significantly also. So. So we're talking about a new, a new period. And I'm going to start by just giving a little bit of background. Um, there's one thing I, I'm going to do. This book is introduced. I should back up and say there's an introduction to this book. And when it came out in Swedish, I, I basically gave a talk and paraphrased the introduction. And then this woman wrote me this angry email and said, well, you only said what was in the introduction. <laughs> well, what should I, you know. So today I'm not going to talk about the introduction. We'll have to leave that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, so that was the lesson uh, to me um, that shouldn't really paraphrase the introduction. There are other things in the introduction that are interesting, but... So, uh, to go back uh, to the uh, Swedish immigrant experience, in 1910, there were about 1.2 million Swedes in America, uh, out of a total population of 90 million. Chicago was the second largest Swedish city after Stockholm. There were 600,000 Swedes in Chicago. Uh, here in Portland, there were 10 to 15,000 Swedes at that time. Um, in Oregon here, between 1900 and 1930, uh, the Swedes were the second largest immigrant group after the, the Germans. Um, the Germans uh, were the largest. In Washington State, between 1880 and 1940, the Swedes were the largest group. Um, I like to say that if there had been ATM machines back in those days, the two languages that would have been offered would probably be <laughs> Swedish and English. And, uh, you know, uh, but uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, and then immigration, of course, came to an end. Uh, the quota laws during the 1920s uh, changed immigration. Um, the last really large year of Swedish immigration to America was 1923. And then after that, it really declines. And then with the, 19, with the stock market crashing and the, the onset of the depression, the migratory flow reversed and people started going back. So at the peak of the reversal, which I think was 1932, 10 times as many Swedes went back as came here. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the whole 1930s, more Swedes went back than came here. Um, so that really is. And then the war, of course, nobody left during the war years. And then after the war, and that's the period where I'm going to talk about uh, there were, uh, there's been about 2,000, maybe 1,500 to 2,000 uh, people a year coming from Sweden uh, to the United States. 
Um, and for the for the Swedes, uh, yeah, the Swedish government keeps pretty good, tra tra you know, good records, and they keep track of people, uh, of who comes and who uh, leaves and that sort of thing. And uh, people who have dug into this uh, have discovered that the, many of the Swedes who emigrated after the war, the war, I'm talking World War II now, uh, they they well they had Swedish passports, but they weren't Swedish. Uh, they were either Jewish or from the, one of the Baltic countries that escaped towards the end of World War II across the Baltic into Sweden uh, to escape the, the Soviets. And uh, they had come to Sweden and been given citizenship, uh, but uh, they weren't really Swedish and, didn't re and they had, many of them had family in North America so, or Canada and they decided to move on once the war was over. So many of those early immigrants uh, uh, really weren't well, ethnic Swedes or Swedish Swedes or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's dangerous in a territory of being politically correct, but ethnic Swedes is maybe a good thing to use. And of course there were many children in that group too, so it really isn't a, a huge number of people. Uh, during, during the post-war period, more women than men have emigrated. And this is interesting, I was just reading the other night that uh, during the big migration, which is 1850 to 1930, there were about 60% men and 40% women. Now, after World War II, it's the reverse. It's 60% women and 40% men. And, and there are some reasons for that. Um, uh, many who come, uh, especially among women, have been au pair girls here. Uh, American families uh, have had a Swedish au pair girl, and that's your first exposure to the culture. You learn the language, you become acquainted with the culture, you, you know how to get around, and then uh, that uh, thing happens, um, which you asked me to say, love. I'm here to talk about love. And that's really the number one reason Swedes uh, uh, to today emigrate, is because they fall in love. So many of those women who come as au pairs um, ended up falling in love and staying. So that's really the number one reason. But I'll, I'll mention some of the, I'll get into detail here about other things. Um, another interesting thing is that the Swedes who have come in the post-war period have not primarily settled in the areas where Swedish Americans have traditionally settled uh, a lot earlier. So today's Swedes don't go to Minnesota or Dakota or any of those uh, traditional areas. Uh, two thirds actually live on the American West Coast, and or they live in metropolitan areas or in Florida. And uh, um, and it's I I think climate is a big thing uh, for Swedes, especially people who approach retirement. They don't want to experience the Swedish winter anymore. They're tired of shoveling snow and you know, long dark winters and they want to know where it's nice. So, so Florida, I can't remember um, exactly how many people uh, Swedes live in, in Florida. The U.S. doesn't really keep track, but there's, there's actually a substantial population of, and they may be snowbirds too, they have a house there and they, or a condo there and they go there and they spend the winters there and then they go back to Sweden for the summer. Um, 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 since 19, but you know we're we're a shrinking group, and I think this is true for all Scandinavians. We're a, we're a shrinking group in, in the United States. Since 1970, uh, the number of Swedish-born Swedes in America has declined with over 60 percent. So we're now less than 50,000. There are actually more Swedes living in Oslo than in the entire United States. There are more Swedes living in Norway than in the entire North America. There are more Swedes living in in London than there are in the United States. So, so Swedish migratory patterns have changed dramatically, uh, and especially after Swedish membership in the uh, European Union in 1995, because now if you can speak the language, you can work and live in any of the European Union countries. So you're free to move around uh, yeah, within Europe, but you've got to speak the language. And so Swedes speak English now, so they go to uh, places where you speak English. Uh, today, uh, there are, you know, there's about 9 million Swedes today. Of those 9 million, uh, about 1 million uh, were not born in Sweden. They come from somewhere else. Uh, but that's the total population. 
about 300 to 400,000 Swedes live abroad, depending on how you define the word live. But if you're registered as a resident of another country, if you are a, a, an au pair or a student, you're not living abroad, you're doing a job, a short-term job abroad, so that doesn't really count. But that's only 3 to 4% of the population, so it's not that much. Um, and then there are, I dug into this years ago for this article that I wrote, and it seems to be about 75,000 people who have moved abroad, and, uh, but they, they never told the Swedish government that they moved abroad, so they're still registered as Swedish citizens, but they are actually living somewhere else. So that's why the, all these numbers are a little bit iffy. And, um, and then there's this other complication when you talk about statistics, and that is that um, you can immigrate more, uh, emigrate more than once. I have emigrated twice, and I have a friend, a Swedish friend, he has emigrated three times. <laughs> and so, you know, so that kind of skews, that kind of skews the numbers a little bit, too. Um, and the reason I went back was I got homesick, and that was in the after, when I, as I mentioned, when I came in the late 70s. Um, because I never heard anything about Sweden, I really got homesick. I felt like I didn't really know what was going on. I felt like I had to go back and see what was happening. And then my family lived there and everything, so, so I ended up moving back. And then if you have a green card and you go back and you don't return within, it used to be 12 months, then you lose your green card. And so I lost it, so then I had to emigrate again. So, but so that, anyway, so that's, that's part of the, the problem with statistics. Um, so after now, as I mentioned, uh, Swedish uh, membership in the European Union, um, the statistics um, are that there are about, um, where people go, there are about 5,000 Swedes who emigrate to other Nordic countries. I think Swedes still move within Scandinavia more than uh, any other um, area. There are about equal numbers to the entire European Union, and um, uh, most of them go to the the UK, and maybe somewhere on the average of 2,000 to the United States. Um, in Oregon today, um, Swedes is, are such a small group, they're not even listed in the, in, in the US census as a group. They, they could, could have clumped all the Scandinavians together, and for language reasons, they exclude the Finns. <laughs> you know, there's this old, this old debate, you know, that Finns are not Scandinavians, they're Nordic. So anyway, so the Scandinavians are number 11 uh, in, in, in Oregon. And in Washington State, they're number 12. So we're not a very large uh, group. The largest groups here, uh, as far as I was able to dig out, dig out of the census was the uh, the Chinese are actually the largest, Vietnamese, Japanese, those are the Asian groups, and Russian, German, and French actually from Europe. And uh, Washington has kind of slightly interesting uh, difference. They have Chinese too as a large group, but Tagalog, I suppose that's Filipino, right? Tagalog. And then Vietnamese too, Korean they have a substantial group, and, Japan, and, and Japanese, uh, and then the European countries are the same. So that's... Um, a little bit different. Uh, another thing I want to talk about a little bit because it's also it really influences uh, the immigrant experience, and that is to ask this basic question: Why do people emigrate? Well, I've already mentioned one reason: you fall in love. But <laughs> that that's just one reason, and it's not really uh, motivate. It doesn't motivate most uh, immigrants. Migration scholars uh, talk about two things. They talk about push, which is considered a hardship. They define push factors as hardships. And then they have something they call pull, which are attractions, things that attract you. So the push and pull is kind of the yin-yang of emigration. And one immigrant is, is never the result of just one force. It's always a combination, but it's different for everybody. So I'm going to list a little bit of these universal uh, uh, push and pull factors um, and, and put them into the context of, of Swedish immigration. For, for Swedes, if we look at the historical immigration, poverty was the number one push factor. I mean, people were dirt poor, so they were pushed uh, out by poverty. And I think you could say that about Hispanics here in, in America today. 
Um, another, another reason uh, the Swedes left uh, was class rule or very little social mobility. Uh, you know, Sweden industrialized pretty late. Sweden hasn't been an industrial country for more than maybe 120, 130 years at the most. And before that, it was an agrarian society that had run out of arable land. And uh, a lot of land was owned by the aristocracy. And the aristocracy had this system, kind of a little kind of remnant of the feudal European system, where they would let somebody live in a little cog croft, they call them crofts, you know. And then they would work X number of days to pay their rent. And they could have a little patch where they could grow potatoes and they could have a cow or two and that sort of thing. And that was very common. So there was, you were stuck, you know, in this kind of social hierarchy that you could never get out of. Even if you were intelligent, you couldn't get an education because you couldn't afford it. It was reserved for the upper class. So class rule was really a, a, a powerful force for the early immigrants. And of course, Sweden uh, doesn't have that. I mean, there's still different social classes, obviously, but uh, it's not really a reason for emigration. Ethnic persecution is another a very common reason for emigration. Um, never really been for Swedes unless you were Sami or a Laplander. Um, then you could have felt um, uh, ethnic persecution, you know, you could have had a Swedish passport, but uh, you weren't really Swedish. But those are tiny numbers. There may be, there may be, I don't know, 15,000 Sami people in Sweden, so a very small group. Uh, there, there are, I suppose there are Finns up in the northern, northern Sweden uh, who m may have felt some ethnic persecution, but um, uh, Finland was not very, it was probably closer than America. Uh, political persecution. Um, there, there are so, there are some instances of that, uh, especially after Sweden industrialized. Um, uh, if you ended up on a blacklist, there was a Swedish novelist. His name was Larsson, Gösta Larsson. He wrote a number of novels. Uh, and if, if you were politically active in Sweden and you ended up, you know, you say you were a union organizer and uh, you got on a blacklist. Uh, it might be better to go to America where no one knew your name. You know? <laughs> so, so there was some of that, but um, um, maybe not a whole lot. Uh, and that's really late. That's maybe uh, post World War One, and that's so that's a short period. That's about a decade at, at the most, really. Maybe right before the war, also. You know, the Wobblies, uh, I've been reading about them recently. Joe Hill, of course, was the International Workers of the World. Mm -hmm. um, but they published a daily newspaper, and the Finns were the ones who published that. That was out of Michigan. That was the daily newspaper of the Wobblies. And I think that was true that here in the Northwest, the Wobblies often worked in the lumber camps. There were a lot of Scandinavians there, so the Scandinavians were quite active in, in here. Um, uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, union movements uh, that happened here. Another reason uh, for um, uh, leaving would be religious persecution. And this is all true for the first wave of Swedish immigrants, and that's pre-Civil War. So that's 1850 to 1865, uh, when uh, it could actually be very difficult to be anything but state church Lutheran. Uh, and you could end up in jail if you uh, were, you know, not saying the right things or believing the right things. Then there's this whole thing about, I just call it escape. And there are different reasons to escape. Um, conscription for men, uh, Swedes had to do military service, and um, the um, officers were usually uh, from the aristocracy, and of course the conscripted people were regular people. And so these officers took a great delight in uh, causing a, a, as much pain as they possibly could on these people. So there were a lot of people who ran away from conscription because it was such a it was such an ordeal to go through. When you read uh, into these things, uh, you realize that also a lot of people escaped unhappy marriages. You know, they told their wife, "I'm going to go and work in America for a couple of years," and they just disappeared. Uh, never came back. Uh, never heard of since. Um, I don't know. I've never seen statistics, but there were people who escaped uh, crimes that they committed 
uh, they, they did something and they decided to leave very quickly. That, that was certainly the case for a number of people. Um, I have another listing here called Preserving One's Honor. A um, you know, hundred years ago, if you had a child out of wedlock, it could be a bad thing. I was just reading about this one woman who got pregnant, so she left. <laughs> uh, rather than having the shame of having a child out of uh, wedlock, uh, you know, the whole community would find out that, that you know, that this had happened. So, you know, just preserving your honor um, in that way. Civil war, fortunately, has never been a reason for Swedes uh, to leave. Um, we haven't had a civil war. But I saw a figure uh, that uh, uh, between 19, no, yeah, 1980 to the year 2000, as much as 2 million El people left El Salvador. That's a tiny little country, you know. That's a major uh, reason to leave. Um, and then economic opportunity. Uh, if there are no economic opportunities and taxes are high, that's a reason to leave. And then, so those are some of the push push factors. The pull factors, uh, pull attractions. Um, the last point, uh, economic opportunity. If the reverse is true, that you can get a job and taxes are low, well, um, and that was certainly the feeling of the early Swedish immigrants. Um, and I was especially reading about uh, Swedish maids uh, the other night, uh, how... Oh no. Oh no. No, I didn't think it was going to fall off. Oh, All right. Um, yeah. so. Okay, we'll manage. Okay. Yeah, but the Swedish maids, you know, they have really a, a, a great deal here compared to what they had in Sweden. So. That was like a typical example. And I'll get into later here economic opportunities for certain modern uh, Swedes to certain professions. Adventure, I think, is, is another reason. Uh, you know, it's hard to quantify adventure, but uh, uh, it's certainly true uh, for me. Uh, I came because I thought it would be a great adventure to see America. You know, I really wanted to see a lot of it. And uh, I thought, um, I, you know, I came in the 70s, so that was sort of the tail end of everything that had happened in the 60s and the early 70s. So there were a lot of things happening that we were all curious about. There was music and film and so on and so forth. Political movements, you know, there were women's rights and gay rights, all of this stuff, hippies and all of this. There was all this stuff was happening here. So it was very exciting, you know, so you had to come and take a look at it. And I suppose that's adventure. And about uh, following your spouse, well then, I mentioned that already. Um, uh, ideology is another reason. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of Europeans uh, who have come from Eastern, former Eastern Europe, and they certainly left because they hated the, the Soviet system. I mean, that's a, a good reason. And I mean, I've never personally met uh, a, a Swede here, but I've had friends, actually someone in this book says, they met someone who said, oh, I escaped the communists in Sweden, you know. But they never, the communists have never been in power, but I mean, obviously there's some people who feel that uh, Sweden is too socialist, and so they leave. Um, sure, yeah, that's fine. But, uh, uh, so ideology does play into it. There are, there are, and then there's this feeling of better opportunities for your children, you know. I mean, if you have, if you have a family, you have children, and you think that uh, another country would uh, provide better opportunities, then you leave. Um, religious tolerance. If you were pushed by religious intolerance, well, then you could be attracted by the reverse, um, religious tolerance. And then, of course, if you're a part of a movement of people, then you're attracted by ethnic community and family that lives in another country. And that's why communities grow as coming to a being, you know, why immigrants join other immigrants. And I think. If you think about these two things then, uh, pushing and pulling, uh, it, you also realize very quickly that this, this influences how you look at your, your, the country you've left. If you were pushed out, like the early Swedes, you were more likely to probably reject it because it, there were all these things that pushed you out. You know, I had to leave, right? And if you leave because of me, like you're, you, want, you want to have an adventure and you really don't know where it's going to end, well, you, you've never really rejected anything, so you have maybe a more positive attitude towards your native country that you left behind somewhere. Um, 
And then there are external forces, you know, depending on the kind of society you come into. Um, I hadn't realized um, how strong uh, a movement there was right around World War I and right after. It was called the Americanization Movement. And Theodore Roosevelt was uh, one of the guys who traveled around the country telling immigrants to drop their hyphen. You know, they weren't going to be German. Americans or Swedish Americans or Danish Americans. They were going to be Americans. Drop that hyphen. You know, couldn't speak, uh, you shouldn't really speak your native language. You should become American, speak English only. That sort of thing. So if you come to that, and especially I think if you're a child and you grow up in that environment, you're much more likely to kind of go with the values of the time uh, than what your parents tell you. Uh, today, I think we're not really in a melting pot in it. I mean, we are basically a bilingual culture now. Uh, the bank machine asks you whether you want to transact your <coughs> withdrawal in Spanish or English, you know. Um, so I think we've gone from a melting pot to a salad bowl. Uh, you know, we're all kind of, we're being tossed together, and, uh, and that's the way we're going to do it. Um, I don't know, uh, some of you might read that uh, a magazine called I know Barton, um, a professor I know, had written a, a little column there. And I'm actually going to quote him um, because it, to me it, uh, it, it's just a short little thing. But he says three things that I think really ring true about why Swedes assimilated so quickly into American culture. And he says, the first thing he says is, Swedes were never more than a small minority in America and never settled in such heavy concentrations as, for instance, the Irish in Boston, the Poles in Chicago, or the Latinos in Los Angeles. And this is certainly true. The second thing he says is, unlike various other immigrants, the Swedes were always welcome in America. They did not feel the same need as others to preserve a separate identity and language in a hostile environment. And I think this is true too, and that's one thing that runs through this book also. No one in this book has experienced any form of, of prejudice or, or bad treatment, you know. And I, 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 I'm not in this book, but I, and I've never done that, I've never had that experience either. I've had one person kind of, um, I remember my kids were really small and we were in a store, and I, you know, I spoke Swedish to my kids, and so they came up and kind of huffy, like, why do you speak? Uh, uh, you, some foreign language that we're in America. And I said, well, I, I speak English also, you know, that's no problem. <laughs> but I said, one experience, and I've lived here over 30 years now. And I think this is true. Uh, Swedes have been extremely welcome in America. Um, so that, that is uh, uh, something that um, influences uh, your view of the culture, I think. And then uh, Barton says the third thing, I want to mention that from that article, Swedes were in America by their own choice. So it was more like the attraction, the pull, rather than the push. Uh, I mean, some were definitely pushed by poverty, but, but he says anyway, Swedes were in America by their own choice, rather than as reluctant exiles from oppression or conscientious preservers of cultures to their homelands. Swedes could not feel free to be as American, Swedes could feel free to be as American as they liked. So, and I think this is really true, this rings true for me too, even though he talks about the earlier immigrants, but you can be as American as you like because you're welcomed. So, but now I want to get back to here the, so the little bit, um, why do Swedes emigrate today? And I think this is true uh, for all Scandinavians. This, I happen to be speaking about Swedes, but I think it's true for all Scandinavians. Um, so, if you work in the U.S., uh, there are certain vocational group categories or groups uh, that have, um, have it's attractive to work in America. And uh, those are employees of international corporations, IT engineers, entrepreneurs, doctors, and a number of professions that are all based on university education. Uh, because most of the Swedes that are here today are, are well educated. And if you take a look at the reverse, uh, you know, for average workers, uh, the U.S. Is, is certainly more difficult to live in um, than, than Sweden is, uh, for all the reasons of universal health care and all of that. 
Um, then there's an organization who, who, who sort of supports um, uh, Swedish identity abroad. It's called Svensk Arvad and Swedes Living Abroad. And um, they did a big survey uh, 10 years ago where they interviewed uh, Swedish couples who decided to emigrate. And so they interviewed 500 Swedish couples who had decided to emigrate. And, and, um, and both were Swedish. And uh, you have to realize, too, that this organization wants political representation in Sweden. So, uh, so they're, they're a political organization. But they, and they rated the reasons why Swedes emigrated. And the number one thing was Swedish taxes. That's why people went out of that. <laughs> and the second reason was improved life quality, climate, societal values. And so those are a little hard to a little hard to pin down what they could be. Life quality can be very different for different people. Societal values also kind of climate, I think we can agree on. Uh, California <laughs> is warmer than Oregon, <laughs> for example. And the third reason, have been offered a job abroad. Uh, Sweden has a lot of international corporations, and so a lot of people get a job abroad, and they take their family, and they leave, and then they discover, wow, this is nice, and they end up staying. So, but what I was wanted to say though is that, okay, these were Swedish couples who emigrate. They're a minority of Swedish immigrants. Almost all Swedish immigrants are uh, Swedes who have married Americans. And, and that's the number one reason, as I mentioned, is falling in love. Um, the Swedish government does not track what happened. Once you leave Sweden, they don't track it. But if you move back, they do uh, pay attention to that. So then you get back into their records again. And so they know that uh, two thirds of all emigrated Swedes eventually uh, move back home. So that's two thirds. That's 66 percent. And if you buy a Swedish, means that you have both parents born in Sweden. So again, we're back to this ethnic Swedish. Uh, 80 percent move back, except in North America, where the number is slightly lower. So here it might be like 75 percent who move back who actually live here. So those are kind of interesting um, uh, numbers, uh, too. And uh, the net migration uh, to the United States is between 300 and 1,000 a year, has been since World War II. Then, um, how are we doing on time? That's, is that the right? Yeah, that's the right time. Yeah, all right, all right. You know, what has happened, too, is that um, Partly because of what happened during the 1930s and World War II, and then the fact that there was this, this long period when uh, Jewish people and, and uh, Baltic people and Swedish passports left, meant that there was like a, a whole a whole generation at least where there was no family connection. So the people who sort of trickled in later um, have found there's this huge group of Swedish Americans who think they are Swedish here in America and. Uh, and then these people come from Sweden, and you discover that Swedish American and Swedish is not really the same thing. So I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Just uh, uh, what that is. Uh, according to the census, there are four and a half million people in the United States who consider themselves uh, Swedish American. And then you don't have to just pick one either. You can be Swedish American and Norwegian American, several things at once. So uh, you should keep that in mind too. Uh, of those, about 125 to 150,000 live in Oregon. Of those, four and a half million people, less than 25,000 speak Swedish. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, been, that's an ongoing debate that's been going on for 100 years, whether you have to speak Swedish to be Swedish. <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, most, most people think that you don't, but um, I think if you really want to get under the surface, you do need to speak it. Um, Swedish Americans also, I mean, and, and this is kind of, I'm generalizing out of these four and a half million people, obviously people who are engaged have a good knowledge of what, what happens in Sweden today, uh, politics, culture, and social progress. Uh, most Swedish Americans who end up in the census have no clue what goes on in Sweden today. Um, and I say there's little sustained interest in contemporary Sweden. Uh, there, there's not really uh, a discussion of what happens there. And um, maybe the genealogists 
which has uh, become a huge thing uh, to be a genealogy or a track family. They are maybe the most active um, uh, group uh, among the Swedish Americans. And um, to me and to many others, uh, to be Swedish American seems to be a way to define yourself among other ethnic groups in America. So you, you choose an identity to distinguish you from, from all the other groups that are here. And then when you come as a Scandinavian uh, to America, or as a Swede, a Swedish American, uh, there are three areas where you notice uh, uh, large uh, differences. And uh, these are uh, in the areas of politics, morality and culture, and, and religion. And uh, in political there, you know, the Swedish political system is a multi-party system. I think there are like six or seven political parties right now. Um, uh, the role, the view that people have of the government is very different in Sweden than it is here. Ronald Reagan, if you remember, uh, his favorite motto was, government is the problem. Right? That's what got him elected twice. Government is the problem. I think a lot of people resonate with that because, uh, you know, there, there's the history of what the U.S. government has accomplished in many areas. I think most Swedes wouldn't agree to that, though. I think, you know, uh, the Swedish government has done a lot of good things. Uh, uh, they had to fight hard to get it, uh, but it's, uh, I don't think most, I, 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 I stick my nose out here, but you know, I think most Swedes would not agree with uh, what Ronald Reagan said. You know, and then there's views on universal health care, paid vacations, maternity and paternity leave, government subsidies of all forms. I was home when my father passed away, that was about 10 years ago, and uh, I was just kind of, you know, jet lag, and ended up in front of a bank. I uh, remember, and they had this thing, and they listed these. It was like a list of five different government subsidies <laughs> that you can get. There's like a rent subsidy, or a low income subsidy, or a study subsidy. It was like this long list of subsidies. You know, it's like wow, this is a different world. You know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's it. So it is really. I mean, the whole system is completely. I mean, there's a welfare system, so it's totally yeah, different. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's right. That's right. But you know, in, in another, I, I, there was this lecture that you can see lectures on the internet, and so there was this Swedish uh, professor of economics, and he made this claim. And I don't, you know, I, I can't verify this, but he claimed that in Sweden, of all the taxes you pay in, 85% are returned to you over the course of your life. That's the highest tax rate in, in Europe, but you get 85% back. Well, is it worth paying? I don't know. Um, Anyway, uh, so, so, you know, public transportation, for example, um, you know, if you want to go between the two largest cities in Sweden, uh, Stockholm and Gothenburg, you can probably catch a train, I would think, every other hour, almost. There will probably be at least 10, tra 10 trains a day, um, at least, probably 15 trains a day, up and down, back and forth. Between here and Seattle, <laughs> I think it's two trains a day. <laughs> maybe, I mean, you can maybe get to there on time. Maybe not. You know, so for example, so you know, there's a whole different uh, approach to things. Um, moral, cultural differences, um, views on the death penalty. Uh, there is no death penalty, it hasn't been in Sweden for 100 years. Um, views on crime and punishment. Um, I. Um, well, I get that's a whole, that's a big subject, yeah. Weapons, uh, you know, in Sweden you basically can't own a weapon unless you hunt or you're a member of a, some kind of target shooting club or something. Because, because it's not a gun culture you have. No, it's, it's not, not a, a gun culture. It, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not very a, much a gun culture. Everybody knows what it is. This is so and so. Yeah. Everybody knows what guns look like. I know. What they're called. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, that's, that's all very different too, you know, the whole view of, of, of weapons. Um, Nudity uh, is probably uh, very different too. Uh, uh, abortion, living together, having children without being married. Uh, these things are, are different, uh, even though that's maybe not quite as, as different as the other areas. Uh, and religion could be, uh, I can talk a lot about that, but I'm just going to say that the U.S. is a, is a church attending culture with secular holidays. Sweden is a secular country with religious holidays. <laughs> uh, and, you know, my impression, I'm not a religious person myself, but my impression of the church is that it works as a social network. 
I mean, if you Americans yeah, move a lot, exactly. so you know, it's a place where you move to a new place, you go to the church that you used to belong to, whatever it was, Methodist or Lutheran or something, and then you meet people of like mind and you connect, and that's how you get acquainted in a new area. In Sweden, they have what they call the study circle. That's what you do in Sweden. You go to the study circle, and you, that's how you meet people because they study what you're interested in, whatever that is, and they have study circles about everything. <laughs> so that's that sort of. I mean, it, it, it fulfills a social. Role. What's that? Did you have a comment? No. She's um, not heard of a study circle before. What's that? She's from Sweden and she's not heard of a study circle before. Maybe that's what the older people know. Older yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, re I realize I'm not a student anymore. They have, they, they have I feel Facebook. like a student, but they I don't have know. Facebook. They don't need Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, oh, okay. All oh, right. Oh God. I, well, yeah. You know. But it, anyway, I mean, we all work together, as we all know that you know, to preserve traditions and all of that. Um, and and I think um, Swedes and Swedish Americans really do come together in all in, in those efforts to preserve culture. So that's that's really good. But my, my sense is still doing some numbers is that about it's about one percent of the ethnic community that is active, actively involved. If there are 125,000 Swedish Americans here in the state of Oregon, could there be 10,000 on that? Mm -hmm. nah. mm -hmm. no, it's probably more like a thousand that are active, right? So, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that many. You know, so 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 again, it comes back to this: what it means to be something, you know. Um, and then I want to say, and that goes through this book too, um, that um, when you when you come as a as a Swede, you develop relationships with other immigrants. They don't necessarily have to be from your own country, but they're immigrants, because what you discover is that they have they have that outsider view. Also, they look at America with um, you know knowing a different system and so you look you look out from the outside in and you share and you have a lot of things to talk about because you have that outside view uh, and it's maybe more international i don't know so so if you contrast the the earlier immigrant experience with the more recent one uh, that i belong to i mean the, the clearest Thing, uh, or most obvious thing to me is the disappearance of an ethnic uh, community. Portland was a Swedish uh, city. It had a Swedish newspaper that was published every Saturday. Um, you could go to Swedish doctors, dentists. Uh, there were lots of Swedish stores. Uh, there were lots of Swedish churches. Uh, you know, the Lutheran church, there was the Baptist church, there was the Methodist church, uh, the Covenant Friends, they all had churches. Um, there was a Swedish hospital, Emanuel Hospital is a Swedish hospital. Um, started that way in a way. Um, and you know, they had all these lodges, Linnea was the big one for the Swedes and so on. So there was a whole community that you could plug into, uh, that you came here and there were all these things. You didn't even have to learn to speak English, because you could live within your Swedish community here. And for us who have come, that doesn't exist. When I came, you know, there was very little left, and that was in the late 70s. So, uh, so there were no neighborhoods even, you know. Albina used to be Swedish, and the Northwest used to be Swedish. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the Swedes were. Um, that sense of isolation that I spoke of, that I experienced, um, um, that came in the late um, 70s. Um, so I, I mentioned the death of the Swedish press, uh, so there was really no news. Uh, there were lo no vibrant ethnic communities where you could go and speak your language. Uh, no neighborhood stores, restaurants, organizations where you spoke Swedish. Um, and then, I mean, it's, it's, it seems to me, I, I talked to, uh, God, I can't remember her name now, she's up in Seattle. Um, she's the uh, director of the, uh, the, Swedish, uh, the Swedish club. Anyway. Um, yeah, Christine, um, yeah. what's her last name? Yeah, Melander. Leander, Leander, thank you, Wilson. Yeah, Leander, Christine Leander. Right, she said that there was something that happened to Swedish American organizations in the 70s 
Uh, up until that point, there were so many Swedes in these organizations, they didn't really feel the need. They would have things, she said, like Italian um, dinners and things, <laughs> because, because they, all, they were Swedish and they ate Swedish food all the time. So they did things like, you know, well, let's eat Italian tonight. And, and it wasn't really an interest in, in, in Swedish things. But she said that during this time, in the 70s, these organizations kind of rediscovered their roots because the, the people who had come, who were born in, 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 in Scandinavia or in Sweden, they had sort of died off. And it was their children who had grown up here. They sort of rediscovered their, those roots. And that was my impression, too, when I came here in the 70s, uh, uh, late 70s, and I ended up going to various lodges and organizations. It's like, and what, I didn't, didn't really feel that they could give me what I, what I needed, you know, as far as a connection to my culture because they really didn't have that. So, um, so that, that was another e e experience. And then it was too expensive to make phone calls, you know, letters were difficult, um, the food was different, uh, the seasons were different. Everything was really a, a, quite a shock coming here. And then the 90s, uh, things started changing. Um, it was, suddenly became cheap to make phone calls. Uh, that, uh, you know, you can make a phone call and not get ruined. Uh, the, fax machine, the fax machine was a real rev revolution. Uh, I, I, I worked as a technical translator for many years, and I worked for the Swedish company, and if I didn't understand anything, I would, I would send a fax before I went to bed, because that was like midnight or so, it was cheap to send a fax down, you know, and it was like 8 o'clock in the morning in Sweden, so they would get it when they went to work, and then they would answer my questions, and right before they left work, they faxed the answers back to me, and I just woke up. I thought this was, wow, <laughs> I, you know, what a revolution the fax machine was. That was the 90s. And then came the internet, you know, and this has really, this has really changed the immigrant experience, because all of a sudden, you're not away. You can be, you know, someone will say, oh, you should watch this program, you know. Oh, yeah, oh, okay, and then you go and, your computer becomes your TV, and here's a Swedish TV program, and you sit there, and now it disappears, and wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you can do everything on the internet. You do your banking, you order your train tickets, hotel rooms, whatever you need, you just do it there. So, that is really, I mean, that's a huge subject, the internet, how that has changed, it, you know. And I think maybe that has changed the need for Americans, or for Swedes, to participate in Swedish American organizations, because well, I think what most of us crave who are here is to hear our native language, you know, and to speak it. I, I don't know if most, but for me that that's important. So I'd rather listen then to a Swedish program on television than go to speak English about something, you know. Because uh, <laughs> I speak plenty of English anyway, as it is. And yeah, I, I've spoken here for almost an hour. Um, I, I will mention one thing quickly, if I haven't uh, uh, bored you too much, and that's Joseph Campbell. Do you all know Joseph Campbell? You know, the great American mythologist? Uh, he wrote a book six years ago called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And, and what he talks about in this, in this book is that there is a, 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 um, that there is a, a universal pattern uh, in all cultures, and it uh, goes through history, so it's not specific to a time or a place um, and, and and it's for Campbell talks about eight different things in this circle but the main character I can simplify it here the main character it, it, the hero he, he or she receives a call to enter an unusual world of strange powers and events and that's the the call to adventure the hero must then face Tasks and trials is called the road of trials, and may have to face these trials alone, or may have assistance, the experience of an adversary. If the hero survives, the hero may achieve a great gift, learning from the challenge. And if the hero is successful in returning, completing the cycle, he returns from the experience a wise, more complete person, the discoverer of important self-knowledge. The gift may be used to improve the world. And this, I think, uh, you can fit this on without too much tweaking onto, this, onto the immigrant experience. So, 
here, these people here, receive a call to travel across the ocean to the great country in the West, sometimes initiated by an American spouse. Each narrator must face uh, tasks and trials in this new world, mastering a new language, learning new customs, new patterns of behavior and social interaction, new values, new food, new seasons, a new natural environment, and so on. The spouse or the ethnic community acts as an assistant or intermediary. And in this context, the phrase, if the hero survives, can be understood if the immigrant manages to remain in his or her new homeland, he or she has learned from the challenge of a new life. In psychological terms, we can understand this as the ability to negotiate a new identity, a new sense of self. The gift is, in Campbell's terms, the discovery of important self-knowledge. And so I, I, I meant to read some excerpts, but I, I've spoken too long already. So uh, if you read the book, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize that pattern. Do you bring your books with you to sell? Yeah, I did bring some books, yes. Okay, maybe there's some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe there's some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two draws that, that I would ask you to uh, share with us your thoughts on as to how strong they still might be. Uh, to Swedes as well as other Scandinavians. One is our higher education system, which still is among, if not the best in the world. There are so many Scandinavians that get graduate degrees, masters, PhDs, you name it, from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, etc. And getting a graduate degree often leads to connections that result in very nice employment. And I wonder if that is still a vibrant draw. And the other is, if you're into IT, Silicon Valley is still the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that also draws some Swedes and other Scandinavians. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. For the I mean, I think all of Scandinavia has a real strong tradition of education as being really important. So, I mean, they do lean on, on kids, you know, to finish the school and, and go on. And the fact that uh, in, I don't, I can't speak for the other countries in Scandinavia, but in Sweden, uh, uh, higher education is free. Uh, you know, there are no, I mean, there are mi minor charges at the university, but basically it is free. I mean, you have still have to live somewhere, you have to eat, and but it's not like the U.S. You know, I don't know what it costs to go to Harvard these days, but. Uh, it's not, it's not free. So, I mean, it, there is a free higher education. And, and when I went, uh, when I got my PhD, which was in the, uh, I went through the 80s, I mean, I could still, I mean, I, I got it in something as useless as American literature, you know. <laughs> and, and they were still willing to pay for that. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing, really. It's amazing, really. I mean, there was no guarantee of a job. I could have gotten a job, but I mean, there was no guarantee of a job. And still, they paid all the way through. <coughs> it's, it's amazing how generous the system is for high, high, higher education. So I think that generates, um, and, and because I think Swedes in my generation are basically bilingual with English. Uh, and it, it, if you're working uh, in a postgraduate environment, you do speak English. So therefore, it's not that difficult to move into uh, an academic environment in the United States or the UK or somewhere else where they speak English. And then as far as Swedes going to the Silicon Valley, yeah, there are, there are I don't really know too many, but I know a couple, you know. Um, I mean, Sweden tries to have its own little Silicon Valley, it's called Sheets, Stouts, and Stockholm. Uh, but, um, they do have a couple, a couple of, of, of good IT companies. Ericsson, you know, I've been collaborating with, with uh, uh, Sony, and the, fin, the Finns have Nokia, of course. So, um, but exactly how many out of this? You know, we're not that many people. I mean, as I said, we're less than fifty thousand people in the U.S. now. So, I would still think that the IT group is, is a fairly small one. But there, I know people here locally in the Portland area who work in IT, information technology. You know. So it is certainly a profession that um, Swedes and Scandinavians get into. Yeah. Yes. I'm under the impression that earlier immigrants from Sweden wanted to be citizens. What is the American citizenship issue with the newer 
Uh, it varies. Um, uh, the Swedes changed their law in 2001. So before 2001, if you became the citizen of another country, you had to renounce your citizenship. And this is still true for the Danes, I think. Yes, it is. And, and still true for the Norwegians. I don't know how it is for the Finns. But... Um, Duo. Huh? Duo. Duo. Duo? Oh, you love Duo. Okay. Well, anyway, so in Sweden now you can have dual citizenship. So um, I became an American citizen. So I'm a dual citizen. So I've got two passports. Um, and I think the Americans are, are kind of looking the other way. Because, I mean, you know, because when you do take the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, you renounce your allegiance to foreign kings and potentates or whatever the line goes. <laughs> and um, so, so, you know, so I mean, the, the Americans are kind of, you know, just look, they do look the other way. So it's not like you have to. But I know that Americans, like if you as an American citizen only have American citizenship, if you were to move to Sweden, and decide to take Swedish citizenship, you would have to renounce your American citizenship. That's what I understand that. And I could mention too, actually, by the way, that um, in terms of uh, people as percentages of the population, there are 17 times as many Americans living in Sweden today as there are Swedes living in the US. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, 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 they're Americans emigrate to Sweden, not Swedes to America. Yeah. The 70s were so explosive culturally here in the United States. Yeah. Late 70s specifically, mm -hmm. I'd be interested in your immediate impression if you look back on that as someone parachuting in here from Sweden what, and, and how that felt coming in. I thought it was extremely exciting. I mean, yeah. you know, I thought it was, I, I thought the world was going to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I suppose it has changed, but not the way I thought it would change. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I, I mean, it seemed to me like all those movements that I mentioned, you know, uh, gay rights, <clears throat> feminism, uh, Native American kind of standing up, you know, as, as kind of, you know, affirming Native American culture, um, you know, the whole opposition to the Vietnam War, all of these things. Um, I, what more, the ecological movement, of course, back to the land movement, uh, environmental awareness, all of this seemed to come out of the American West Coast, you know? It was really, yeah. I mean, I, I was just...